بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رمضان مبارک میں اللہ سبحان و تعالیٰ ایکسیپٹ اور اعمال وٹ ایور وی ہیو بین ایبل ٹو ڈو دس فار اینڈ گیو اس توفیق ان شاء اللہ ٹیک دا بیسٹ بینیفٹ فرام دس منتھ ان شاء اللہ تعالیٰ Today we want to look at one of the aspects that has been really emphasized in the month of Ramadan and that is this idea of dua, supplication. This is a month that is a month of dua and all our imams and the Prophet ﷺ have taught various duas and that is why in the books of dua when you open them there is a huge section, probably the biggest section is on the duas to be asked in the month of Ramadan because this is the month of asking and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is liberal in giving in this month. So we want to look at that as to what is dua. So I just brought a few questions around which I want to talk. The first is that what is the reality of dua? What is dua all about? And what should we ask for in dua? And if we just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to sort our problems, does that make man lazy or bari? He doesn't have to do anything now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look after him. How do we know the du'as are accepted? How should we ask? What are the, what are the ways and adab of asking of du'a? And finally, why do people say most of the du'as are not answered? When Allah has promised to answer them, we are asking du'a day and night. And Allah says He will answer them, but they are not answered. So these are some of the things I want to talk about in this first section, inshallah wa ta'ala. Inni qareeb. When my servants, they ask about me, tell them I'm close, not far. Ujibu da'wat al-da'i idha da'an. I always answer the prayer of the one who is supplicating to me as long as he is asking me. Fal yastajibu li wa li yu'minu bi la'allahum yarshudun. So let them reply to me this da'wah of asking me. Let him ask me and let him believe in me so that he is rightly guided. So first of foremost it seems that dua is almost something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to do. And dua is this connection between human beings and God which really is an ibadah actually because it shows first and foremost that we consider ourselves needy in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not consider ourselves independent and we can go and do anything but we recognize our utter neediness in front of God. This is very important. Often times different scenarios happen in life we forget to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the tawfiq, for, for the success because we, it is simple, we know how to do it and we are sure we will do it and we imagine that it is us who is doing it But if we get in the habit of saying, Ya Allah, okay, I know the way forward, I know what I have to do, but I ask you for khair. And that is why Imam Sadiq would say that a mu'min does not leave or do any action without istikhara. And istikhara doesn't mean necessarily opening the mushaf and looking and seeing whether it's good or bad. It means talabul khair, seeking goodness. You come out of your house and say, Ya Allah, I am going out to my normal work, whatever I am doing. I seek from you khair today in all that I endeavor to do. And khair is different from success. Khair means that the work you do has some effect on your growth towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's goodness in it. We need to understand that everything we require, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can provide. One of the scholars, Ayyub Behjat, he writes that one day he was working in his, it was hot, so he was working in the hayat of his house. And he heard the doorbell next door ring and the child went to answer the door. And there was a man who was asking for something. He said, I'm hungry and go and tell your mother to give me something. Ayyub Behjat says that the answer given by the child, it made him think. Because the child told him, why don't you ask your mother? She will give you. And Agha Bahadur said it was the child's trust that mother gives everything. Whatever he, she, he needed at his age, his mother was giving him. And he was saying to the beggar that your mother will give you. Agha Bahadur said, when did we forget that Allah will give us everything? Just like he has always given us. We should have that trust like this child has in the mother. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us everything. We turn first to Allah and then we turn to others and turn to other things and ourselves. 
Generally, we tend to the other way around. We do what we want, and then when we are in trouble or we are not sure, now we say, Ya Allah, help. So we need to get into this idea that dua. And if you look at the duas that are taught to us uh, in the month of Ramadan, they are very instructive. They are not just supplications, but they are instructions on how to communicate with God, how to ask, what to ask for. You will find, generally speaking, in the duas and taught by our Imams, السلام, that it begins with praise of Allah. Not because Allah needs our praise, but because by praising Him, by identifying Him, we are saying, Ya Allah, I know you are all of these things. I know. That's why I'm going to ask you something. Because I know you are capable. I know you are merciful. I know you have no limit to your, to what you can give. Then the, when you see what they ask for, it is usually one or two lines they ask for. And it is always on ukhrawi matters, on matters to do with akhirah. Because if your akhirah is secure, dunya doesn't matter. Dunya is a temporary place. But if dunya is secure and akhirah is insecure, that is a permanent place. So they always say something like, you know, Fukka rakabati bin an-nar, save my neck from the fire of hell, keep me away from hell, put me in jannah, adkhilni fil jannah. Things like this which are really important in the final analysis. It doesn't matter how you got to Jannah as long as you got to Jannah, isn't it? All the problems along the way, all the trials you face, all the difficulties you face, they mean nothing if Jannah you get. By the same way, it doesn't matter all the blessings you got, all the good life you got, if you don't end up in Jannah. So these are the things Imams are training. And there's many, many things that are in these du'as, which are not just about asking, but also learning. And certainly, we should not be in the habit of just reciting them. Because often we say we are reciting the dua, it should be we are asking the dua or we are pondering about the dua. But the dua initially is to show our utter neediness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How should we ask? We should ask with presence of mind. Often there are many duas. Or if there is one dua, there are many lines in that dua. It's easy to get caught up in just reciting it. So in addition to reciting it, because when people recite together, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he accepts from one of them, will accept from all of them. This is the hadith. So it's good to sit together and supplicate to God. But also it is good to take small portions out and actually start to talk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through a kind of personal munajat, conversation with Allah, asking him directly, personally, and with full concentration of what you are asking. Um, in one of the hadiths we have in Bihar that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Musa, what would you do if you had a slave who you told him to come and talk to you and when he was talking to you he was looking everywhere else and he was not paying attention to you and he was being rude. Musa salam, said, if he was this way rude with me and he is my slave, I would tell him to go away. I would release him and not keep him with me anymore. I would not look after him anymore. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, my slaves, when they stand in prayer, their hearts are like this. Everywhere they are looking with their heart, but they are talking to me. But I don't tell them to go away because they are mine and I forgive them and I guide them. So when we talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our heart is here, there and everywhere, Allah sees the hearts, just like you and I see the eyes. And from the eyes we can tell that this person is not interested in what we are saying to him. In the same way, our hearts are everywhere. So we need to have presence of heart and ask. Oftentimes people say, my dua is not accepted because really they haven't asked. They have said a few things, but they haven't asked with all their heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of what they want. Does it make people lazy? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, did not say that you tell me, Ya Allah, I, inni ufawidu amri ilayk, I leave all my matters to you, and then you go and sleep under your, your blanket. No. Everybody has to strive. Everybody has to, to work in the normal way. What you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to give you tawfiq in that action, make it successful. Um, in a hadith from Imam Sadiq, he says, Allah will never accept the dua of someone who asks for more rizq but sits in his home doing nothing. This is not the system of God. The asking is of saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me tawfiq in my activity. The activity is there, but make it successful. Another reason for asking actually is to become an agent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like a talqeen, like a self, 
uh, telling yourself. Like for example, when we are say, when we say, Allahumma, adkhil ala ahli al-qubur al-surur. Oh Allah, those who are in the qubur, in the graves, let them be happy. It means through you. So you are teaching yourself that I go to the Ahlul Qubur, I recite Fatiha, I do khairat for my parents who have passed away, and I do something. This is the way I adkhil ala Ahlul Qubur surur. I become the agent of that dua being come to fruition, come to pass. Not that I say to God and then I have nothing else to do in it. So dua often is about saying to Allah, let me participate in making this true. Give me that tawfiq, give me that, that uh, inspiration to do it. This is dua and this is the month of dua and this is the month of acceptance of dua easily why because you are the dhaif of Allah the guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and guests are given easy rides by the hosts guests normally because they have already been honored especially since they have been invited then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not dismiss the request of his guest inshallah ta'ala may Allah give us tawfiq in this to ask dua from him constantly inshallah ta'ala when we come to the Masails, we are looking at several ones. Today, I want to talk about certain penalties. We have a penalty, we call it fidya. This is a monetary amount given when you do not fast for an acceptable reason and do not pay the qada till the next year, then there is a fidya and we talked about it. It's half a three quarter kilogram of food stuff. But there is a penalty. So fidya is a compensation, but there's a penalty for an infraction called kafara. Kafara is not always a monetary amount. It is a penalty you pay because of a rule you broke. So for example, if someone breaks their fast intentionally, ah, I'm tired of this fast now, I'm just breaking it, I go and eat. There is um, kafara, of course, but there's also a kafara. Or for example, after intimacy and so there is janaba diurnim, not caring whether they will be able to do the ghusl before the fajr, before the fast starts and just ignoring all that, there is kafara. This kafara in, in, uh, in hadith is one of three. The first is freeing a slave. Now in this day and age, that is not an option. We do not have slavery in the modern era. So freeing a slave doesn't feature into what we can do. The second is to fast. And this shows the gravity of this. Fasting 60 fasts for each fast that you broke in this way or you didn't keep in this way. Even not keeping the fast or breaking it, um, you know, without reason. Kafara is to feed 60 people to their fill or giving them three quarter kilogram food for them to, 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 to have. Um, 60 people. Uh, sorry, so 60 fasts, first of all. Uh, 60 fasts, these ones, if you do this kafara, you have to keep 31 of them continuously. 31 of these are consecutive, and the other 29, you can have breaks in them. Or the third kafara is that you feed 60 people to their fill, and, uh, or give them three-quarter kilogram of rice or food grain each, so that they can be satiated by that. Now, you are meant to choose from these three kafaras. If, for example, you break the fast, but this time not with a halal thing or a halal way. For example, the one way of breaking the fast uh, without reason is to drink water. Another way is not only to drink water, but to eat something haram, something najis, alcohol, naudhubillah, or some other food which is najis. This then, according to precaution by fuqaha, you need to do all three of the kafara. Now obviously slavery is out of the question, all three. So this is, a, it is ihtiyat masala, it's not wajib, but you can see that it becomes even graver. Kafara is to show that you have actually broken a law and it has a penalty. It has a consequence. It is a defiance of God for which there is a penalty. We understand penalties we understand consequences when we break laws here in this country of the law. There is a penalty, a fine. This is what kafara is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us in these masails, inshallah wa ta'ala, so that we can fast properly as taught by the Prophet. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our a'mal in this month. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.